uh, I've briefly um, exchanged mails with Klaus and he might drop by between 1630 and 1700. So okay. if we manage to do transport indication um, around then, that might be helpful. All right. Yeah, then we can probably swap co-op attacks and transport indication to be on the safe side. Well, that's agenda bashing. So hello everyone, let's just wait a couple of minutes more with people still joining. As usual, I'm getting Thank coffee. You. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you, Karsten. Thank you, Christian, for helping taking me out. Okay, being three past, we can start. Uh, welcome everyone to this interim meeting of the core working group. I am Marco Tioca, my co-chair is Jaime Jimenez. Uh, as usual, uh, please be aware that the note well applies, get familiar with it if you're not already. And it's not just about IPR, it's also about code of conduct, uh, especially. So be nice and professional with one another. And that said, the agenda for today includes uh, the usual round of updates on ongoing work in the um, two most advanced core comp documents uh, and then href and coral. And then we have a number of uh, documents with recent activity uh, on the list and the data tracker. Uh, we have in order um, conditional attributes for which Bill has just resubmitted um, a revision. Uh, transport indication, uh, which Christian is also uh, working on with some activity on the list also um, today and more in the background. Uh, and then we bring back a document that we also had in the agenda uh, at the previous um, interim meeting, uh, co-op attacks. Uh, so we've had some bashing already, uh, swapping transport indication and co-op attacks. Uh, any further bashing you want to propose for this agenda today? If no, then we can start with the initial round of updates uh, on the core comp documents. So there will be Kirsten, I guess. I haven't seen any particular activities on the list on this, but uh, maybe something is happening on the background.
Karsten, are you actually back? Yes, and what part All of right. the agenda are we in? Uh, we have just started with CoreConf, if you have any update to share. Okay, so we just had a one hour meeting um, between the some of the authors of the, the Yang Sibo documents and some array directors and uh, some of the Yang luminaries. And uh, we were discussing how to uh, do the yangcatalog.org support uh, for SID files. And uh, about halfway through the discussion today, um, we decided we really have to write this up in the core SID document. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a pretty substantial amount of information that needs to go in there. So it looks like we will need to do another last call, maybe just an IETF last call. Um, let, let's see. And uh, yeah, so the, the plan is to write up what was discussed today into a pull request on the CORSID uh, document and uh, get buy-in from, from all the uh, parties. And that might help us uh, clear uh, the discuss. Sounds and good. Oh, sorry. I have told uh, Rob Wilton that I think the normative reference from Yang Sibo to Corsid is a mistake. And uh, we should get rid of that. And he said, uh, let's talk about that. So at least he didn't <laughs> uh, outright uh, disagree. Uh, so let's see, maybe that is a way to get at least the Yang Sibo document uh, through the, the uh, process. But the, the main point is uh, we, we will have uh, another update to the SID uh, document. We ha will have another process uh, round on this, maybe even the telechat um, uh, date. And uh, But that, that will allow us a significant uh, jump ahead because the information that is in core SID essentially was negotiated with IANA. And IANA itself doesn't have the, the, the budget to actually do the uh, server-side support uh, for SID. Um, and Yang Catalog Org does have the budget. So we, we now have a new partner to, to talk to. And um, that, of course, means we will have new text in the document. Sounds like a very good plan. Uh, thanks. Uh, on the possible ITF last call, I think Francesca, yeah, had a plan to compare uh, the diff and take a decision on that, but that will come later. OK, so we should expect a pull request anytime soon. Right, uh, I think that's it on this document cluster. Thank you. Uh, okay, if we move on to href and coral, I, I did see some activity on the GitHub at least on on some details on href. We're still in that process where we, we are adjusting our implementations that uh takes longer than it should, not because it's particularly hard to do, but because it's uh, just hard to find time uh, for it. Um, yeah, so we will have to continue this uh, for a little longer. Okay, uh, right. Uh, we have some more, one more interim meeting next week. Uh, just a team expectation. Uh, can we expect a revision for ITF 113 that we can consider for working group last call? Or would you need more time? Well, that's at least an uh, aspirational goal. Okay. Thanks. Hope we can make it. All right. Uh, I can think of actual updates on Coral happening uh, during the last two weeks or so. Uh, Christian, do you have anything you want to share on that? Uh, no, sorry. No problem. I know the work is continuing anyway. 
All right, uh, so that will conclude the initial round of updates. Uh, now, the main next presentation will be on conditional attributes. And Bill has just submitted a new version and should join any minute uh, to present it. We have the slides already. Uh, and I have a preference of discussing transport indication uh, somewhere in between 1630 and 17 CT uh, to accommodate also some points from Klaus. Uh, so until Bill joins, I think we can rather move to uh, co-op attacks instead. I can move it up. So uh, there was a discussion at the previous uh, interim meeting uh, three weeks ago uh, it was important to cover uh, this kind of work, but it was also important to, to, to split in detail what was about to cover in core and pretty much now, uh, and what instead was not, and uh, instead deserved more um, work from a, from a research point of view. Uh, so the split happened according to, to what discussed, and now we have uh, still the uh, co-op attacks draft in core, focusing on attack, uh, attacks against co-op, while well, uh, all the parts related to uh, attacks using co-op, including amplifications, and used to be section three, uh, was now moved to um, a separate document in, in T2TRG. Uh, so the split that was discussed um, happened, and now we have uh, a document uh, focusing on what there seems to be consensus to work on here. So uh, unless there are any <laughs> concerns left uh, on this, uh, I think we can start uh, a call for adoption on the list. Uh, does anyone have any last minute concern of taking this uh, work as an informational document in the core working group? Hearing none. So we'll start a two week adoption call on the list. All right. And now I see Bill on the roster. Hi, Bill. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit late. Uh, no worries. And we did a bit of live agenda, agenda bashing. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, and now it's actually perfect for, for your presentation. So um, you can share the PDF yourself. Excellent. I'm trying to. Yeah. Okay, uh, share this. Is my slide coming through? Yes, I can see them. So can I. I hope everybody else sees them too. All right, um, I think we can start. So hello, uh, I'm Bill Silverajan and uh, I'm the editor for the Conditional Attributes draft um, that has been uh, split from the Dynalink draft. Um, so this is a quick status update of what's happened and uh, what will possibly happen soon. All right, so um, moving on, the draft has basically moved um, since the last interim meeting I attended was um, in September. So so the draft has moved on now from 00, zero to, to zero 02. It's, it's a fresh 02, just fresh out of the oven like half an hour ago. I submitted it to the... Uh, uh, using the submission tool so you might already see the uh the mail on the mailing list um, um the core mailing list to to explain that this has um, been done and uh i thought uh, i will uh, just let you know what has happened in on, on, in drop zero two so so as usual we continue to incorporate feedback uh we receive updates and then correction clarifications uh, there were three issues on GitHub, and um, they are all closed. They have not been resolved in this draft. Obviously, it doesn't mean that, that there will be more issues in future, but at least these three have closed, and uh, potentially there might be one or two coming up still. But anyway, uh, just to see what has been resolved, um, we had discussed the, the value of the band attribute uh, in the conditional observed draft. Um, how, how do we actually specify um, or indicate um, a band that contains um, something that the uh, the client would like to observe upon. So um, the value of the bread. Hang on, this is this is not correct. Sorry. Yeah. 
So uh, please ignore the previous slides. Uh, so this is the, the result issue. So, so band um, is, is a Boolean, it, would, it used to be a Boolean. And, um, and the way it was used was um, either we put band is equal to one uh, and then the greater than and less than values. But then the, the question was whether it's value is significant. And, and after the discussions, we decided to go with the approach that uh, the presence of the band query parameter is, is enough um, and it should not actually have a value. So in drop 02, um, this is what's happened. So band does not have a value anymore. It's just a query parameter, as, as you can see in the second bullet point, um, the example with the temperature. And um, so that's that's good. Um, of course, now that raises the question whether we should actually include some more guidance in what to do if uh, if a server is um, faced with a query where the query parameter does have a value. So, for example, if it says band equals zero and greet GT on some value and and LT some value, or if it can be band equals to one, so do we um, accept that or ignore that or does anybody have any comments on how we go forward? And so we, we generally have the problem with uh, um, attributes that um, have, for instance, integer values. And if you set it mm. to cook, what do you do? Mm. Um, so this is not a new problem. It just is uh, we we the the empty value is something we we haven't um, defined very well. I mean the the, the underlying mm -hmm. problem is that we're using a term here attribute th that is not really defined. So <laughs> maybe we should do something mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. uh, first. And that's, when that's we define yeah. when we define the term attribute which is a query parameter that we are using in a particular way, either by presence or by value, uh, then we can uh, make some statement about that. Okay. I'll write that down so that we will clarify the next slide. So the, the key question now is, is whether um, if, if this is a known problem, then perhaps it's best not to say anything more, <laughs> or should we should we actually explicitly address this issue if, if uh, somebody has put band equals zero and band equals one? I, I have to check the library and to M um, specifications and, and how they have actually defined it. So that's one of the issues that I that came to my mind. But um, this is something that perhaps yeah. we could. As I said, generally, we are using curb options to do things in, in our mm -hmm. documents. And now that we're using query parameters in a particular way, yeah. I think it's a good idea to introduce a term uh, for for uh, using query parameters in this way. And, and I'm fine mm -hmm. with a term attribute, but maybe we should really just have a section called attributes that, mm -hmm. that introduces that and that also can be referenced uh, by other documents that may want to talk about query parameters. Okay. All right. Take that on board. Any other comments? Okay, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and then we also discuss. We have, this has been an ongoing discussion for a while about about proxies and um, how they can interfere with the operation of this um, of the conditional observe attributes. Um, and I proposed this uh, this uh, text at the last meeting, and uh, there was a slight modification. It was proposed that the server uh, instead of may use next age, it should be should use. And I don't think there was a very strong opinion either way. So let's go with the uh, should use. So that, that is now in the draft um, that has been uh, added to 0 02. Um, security considerations, um, at least uh, there were 7252 and 7641, which is the, uh, the observe uh, RFC. So I um, wanted to ensure that, that these are actually addressed. Um, I do not know if we actually um, 
we've got any other text to describe the uh, the attributes now, but at least this is what we have. Um, IANA considerations, this is, I, I decided to include this. Um, please comment if you think this is necessary, but uh, I thought it would be good to consider whether we need a conditional attributes registry so that we can map all these parameter names to um, uh, what they're supposed to do and um, and then make it a bit easier so that anybody else who wants to include new parameters or new conditional attributes um, could have an expert review. Do you think it's a good idea? So is that a conditional attributes registry or is it an attributes registry? Um, I thought it was conditional attributes. So basically specifically for the core um, and observe. So any other document that you need needs attributes will have to define their own registry. Uh, that's true. <laughs> so we so could that, do it. That yeah. just rhymes with a the theme that you should introduce attributes as a concept. Yeah. at the start and make it available to other documents as well okay but is it, we'll is, is it is it does it make sense to start defining attributes kind of query attributes for general purpose use and in in a list i mean this is i i don't know the rfc um number by head but there is the, that one that talks about us not not uh interfering with the applications uh, with the uri uh, space mm. and we can define for a particular application those attributes and yeah maybe maybe it makes sense for some to opt in and share that space but in general conditional observation and other things that use query parameters might be orthogonal but yeah if this is if this is opt-in maybe that's a that's a good thing so we already mm. had this this uh, conflict with what was it AT? lifetime previously uh, so, yes I, I think I, it's good I, to I, have a global registry yeah. yeah yeah so that's that's what that's what compelled me to think about this as well because we did have this problem with less than and lifetime previously okay but um, that's that's mostly um, the the work that was done, and um, we will continue getting feedback. Like this, this was very good feedback. Now uh, we'll continue on. Uh, I guess we are edging closer towards uh, working group last call. I hope to get one more version um, done by IETF one one three, and then get these things ready. Thank you, yes. Neil. Any more comments, questions? Um, you know, j just thinking about the topic of those uh, th that attribute registry a bit more. If you really want this to be general purpose, if this develops in some into something general purpose, it might update the RFC to be I don't know the number yet for resource directory, uh, mm -hmm. and extend that because we have an attribute registry there for the very attributes we are using there, and okay. it might make sense to to um, swallow in that. That's also true. I'll take that on board. Maybe we'll do this offline, Christian. Is that OK with you? Sure. Sure. OK. So Bill, thanks again. I think if you yep. produce uh, an extra vision incorporating this last uh, comments from today, uh, you can present it uh, in Vienna or at least at IPF 113 somehow. Yep, uh, I, I yeah, hope that, I that, that feels like uh, that should be indeed ready to move yep. on with working group last call. Yep. Okay. So you, you plan to attend online, I guess? Uh, uh, yes, I, will, I, I, I won't be going to Vienna. So I will be, um, I'm, I've, I've registered myself as a remote participant already, yes. Okay. So I count Sadly, on you on, you on one more presentation there. And I mean, you can give a quick overview again of today's presentation yep. before touching the very last points. Of sure thing, sure. In front of a broader audience. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will stop sharing. Right. Which brings us to the... Uh, 
last item on the agenda, we are not precisely at uh, 1630 yet, but I, I think Christian, you can start anyway and Klaus can join later on for discussion. Yep, so this is, um, this is just a few slides of an older interim that I've um, pick, picked into here so that we have a bit, have something on the screen to talk over about. Um, so just to get everyone on board, this is about how do we reconcile that there might be a co-op server that has co-op addresses, that, uh, resources, that has resources both accessible on co-op and on co-op over TCP. How can that server advertise them both at the same time, allow the client to switch over when the, as the client sees fit um, without causing too much, much breakage. This is something that the core group has promised to provide about the time when those non core uh, one when core plus TCP was introduced. And the current proposal that is sitting around in an individual draft of mine based on older discussion, basically based on um, Bill's work, uh, uh, Bill and Mert's work on protocol negotiation and some uh, and some further discussion that we've had with also with Klaus and Ines. Um, this is suggesting that uh, basically we're using the regular link format uh, uh, resource uh, announcement that we already use in, in various places. We'll also work uh, just the same with Coral and then um, add, a, add an extra statement that basically says here that everything that is co-hosted with this resource, so especially the coffee machine atop, is available through a proxy at core plus TCP, my own address, and that with that proxy with that proxy transport, you're still accessing the original URI. With the extension that even the co-op, even the proxy URI option that consumes like five, five bytes or so, on the wire might be removed in an add-on. I've received uh, two reviews so far on this from Marco and from Klaus. Thank you both for those. Um, I've been working them into the into the editor's copy this afternoon, but there are three topics where I think the document still can, where they pointed out things that need to be clarified. Um, that is that even when we don't, uh, one topic is e even when we don't send the URI, uh, the proxy URI option along, which is uh, this version of the mechanism, it may look on the wire like URI aliasing, but actually both the server and the client can be perfectly aware of what the actual URI behind this is. So even that is not really introducing um, your aliasing. It, it might be preferable to some applications to think of it in terms of your aliasing, but it's it can also be viewed in terms of introducing some context for that resource that is basically unpacking these options. Carson? Yeah, I think the on the previous slide you said that the aliasing has to have server opt-in. Um, and yeah. pardon me. Yeah, go, go ahead. I'll come back to that. And um, absolutely, I'm just wondering about mixing provenances here. Um, so, yeah. can we make sure that this statement um, about aliasing is actually originating? from that server? Th that is something that will depend a lot on the particular application's security model. If the application requires that no one can even redirect their traffic, and I wonder how they do that because they just accept uh, uh, accept um, root ad advertisements, uh, unsecured root adver adver uh, RA um, messages, but still, um, if the application wants to be very sure that their traffic is not redirected, then they'll have to place the same requirements they do for all the links that feed into their action, even to the point 
where it is a link that says there is a proxy. If the application does not make such a requirement and prefers to use opportunistic proxies that might be around even though they could do some snooping, but they trust that their OSCORE end-to-end protection will protect their data, then they might have relaxed um, requirements on where that statement is coming from. Yeah, and I think what I'm essentially saying is that I would like to have a section in the security considerations that discusses just what you said. That can certainly be arranged. Um, on the topic of the URI aliasing being opt-in on the server side, that is something where I'm still some of, some of the text is not fully in sync with the mental model of the uh, and with the with the story that I'm trying to get across here. That is, it is not even URI aliasing, or even though it looks like it looks to Wireshark on the on the on the network like that, because all parties agree what the URI actually means. Um, so, considering that, I think that this no aliasing rule can be even be clearer because there will be no URI aliasing introduced by this. It's just some parties that think that can, under certain conditions, even forget that compression information and work as if they were aliased URIs. Well, we could invent a new term like the web address translator. That, that, that rings. Bells that I'm afraid you want to ring that don't sound good. Um, not sure. Um, maybe. Uh, don't know yet. I mean it. it it, it is a theme that in, in, in both the reviews that there are things that need a bit better terminology that is not obviously not fully there yet, but I think this can, uh, this can be worked out as the document progresses. So that was the, the one point emphasizing that this is, this is probably not URI aliasing, it's just a form of compression. And um, just just to be sure, this is only about the case where someone wants to do away with the proxy URI uh, proxy scheme option co-op, literally containing co-op, saving those five bytes, and in, to do that, going through that. If that is not done, it's just it's just regular proxying, and there is no chance of confusion about the involved URIs. Um, the second point that, that Klaus brought up um, was about, hello Klaus, um, perfect timing, um, was about the topic of using your eyes to identify things that we don't, don't really usually identify your, um, with your eyes. So in particular, that, that the, the mechanism and address combination that is used to that, that, that is used when using a particular proxy can be conveniently written down with co-op plus tcp colon slash slash address. And that happens commonly when you think of how HTTP proxies are expressed. But really it is distinct from the resource at the root of that, the, the resource that is served at the root of that host. Um, Given that everything that we have in, in tooling for metadata is working in terms of URIs, I think we can still do that. But it would be clearer if this document would introduce the concept like we have a URI and we use this, we, we use a proxy described by it with a very narrow meaning that is basically scoped to the has proxy, uh, has pro unique proxy properties and possibly any other document that opts into it. And there we be seeing that if it's a co-op URI, it, then the scheme and the address are taken and the path must be empty. And if it's some other proxying mechanism, then that proxy mechanism, please describe how a proxy is described as a URI, um, noting that 
that you write may or may not also describe a resource that is completely distinct from that proxy functionality. Wouldn't change anything on the wire, but would make it a bit clearer what whether that slash at the end here is really relevant or what does it even mean if there is another resource sitting here as well. And the third um, controversial point is the use of the host relation, which is primarily there currently for two reasons. One is, well, two, two things come together. One is that um, even though this was an option in protocol negotiation, we will usually not want to advertise a proxy for each individual resource because in every discovery step, we might provide um, like half a dozen resources Think of the examples of, re of, of resource directory or even anything that is a, uh, that is a multicast um, that is a multicast discovery. And providing the proxy with each of them would at very least require a format that is distinct from link format to express it with any sense of, um, of efficiency. So this direction will need some indirection that groups all the resources together that are served from the same device. And conveniently, there is such a relation, and that is this implicit hosts relationship. The tricky part about hosts is that everyone seems to have a slightly different idea about what it actually means. So those ideas range from it is served by the same physical device over to it is an implied relationship between every resource to the to the same resource, but stripping every path and query component down to the root of that device. Um, and the third being that this is just a name, just a relationship that is implicitly defined when a link is placed in a link format document without an explicit relation uh, link relation. And yeah, that's that's just the value and it means no more nothing more than yeah those who were talked about in the same um, in the same um, link format document without any additional relation so variant one is something I don't think makes a lot of sense because no device can really know that variant two is something that it will probably not hurt if people make that assumption but we I don't think we need it and the third one is the one that I'm hinging everything here on because the RFC 6690 says that this is an implied relation between those resources. That's kind of the default value of rel. And every document we have out there now um, has a lot of these. And it's just simple to say, it's just simple to express this relation between those resources in terms of they are all hosted on slash and slash has a proxy therefore you can reach that resource through that proxy if there are cleaner better and more elegant um, approaches i'd be happy to use them too i just don't have any much better ideas right now in slide three is that what you want um yeah we, there is no um, i'm just skip going through those looking at whether we, there is any better slide no, i just yeah, was wondering whether slides don't update today but uh... Uh, no no it's basically I'm, I'm just using the slides from last time so that at least i can show something because i didn't prepare anything extra yeah so you are on uh, your way to becoming a professor <laughs> <laughs> But slide three shows the, the essentials. We already have that top line here. It has this implicit rel hosts tying it to the slash. And if we just add a single line that is also tied to slash, but with this particular relation and you don't see my mouse cur cursor moving around frantically, but think of me pointing at the blue thingy here and basically following that chain of links, 
the client can arrive at the proxy to use. You wanted to cover only these three points, Christian, or yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's, um, that's basically the th that's the three points that that I'm taking away from the from the reviews. Hmm. There were a few others, but most of them are probably being addressed or being addressable by by small text updates and have been have been updated. So the the larger question, and to me the only question that remains short of those three is how do we make progress on this? Because um, some progress is coming from those two reviews, but in general this is I think I think I'm kind of done with this. Um, so where do we want to take this from there? Personally, I think this is important work. <laughs> I believe it would be good to happen. Uh, in the working group. Uh, it's good anyway if you produce a new revision out of the reviews and you present it uh, at ITF 113 also in front of a broader audience. Uh, then, of course, uh, starting from people here today, what do you think overall of this approach? Do you think it's a good way to um, to handle the multiple transports in co-op or does anyone have a big concern about this approach as a whole? Don't be shy. So five years ago, we made this promise to Adam Roach, who was AD at the time, that we would uh, solve this problem. And um, I think it, it would be good to actually make good on <laughs> that uh, promise. And uh, yeah, of the various ways to, to address it, this indeed has been the most promising way. Um, so I'm, I'm all for pursuing this. Thank you, Carson. Any more feedback, comments? No, then I think we can look forward to having a revised version for Vienna. And thanks for uh, replying to my comments, Christian. Thank you. Okay, uh, which brings us to the end of the agenda uh, and to the AOB. Uh, we have one more uh, interim meeting uh, next week, and that's the last before ITF 113. So we'll meet again at, uh, at the usual uh, day and time, so on Wednesday at 15 UTC. Then we're going to have a two hour session um, at ITF 113. So anything more you want to raise uh, for today? You know, thanks a lot for attending. Talk to you next week. Talk to you next week. Thank, Thank you. you. And hello, Klaus. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.